Let me tell you something. This gives life. And I'm so thankful for the Word of God tonight. This is a precious book, folks. This is precious to me. It ought to be precious to you. It, it is your life. It brings conviction. It brings light. It, it exposes the things that are sinful in our life. But it brings life to me. This Word of God is what brought life to me. And as Paul said, I wouldn't know what uh, sin was until the Bible told me, Thou shalt not covet. Paul said it was the Word of God, it was the law of God, it was the Word of God that showed me my wrongdoing, it showed me my sin, and it showed me also how to get right with the Lord. Hey, would you go to Psalm 19 now? Man, we're all over the place. I love it though. Psalm 19, and then we'll quickly move forward. Just Psalm 19 if you would. We, we've read these verses last week, but it's good for us to kind of refresh our memory if we could Psalm 19 verses 7 and 8 all right Psalm 19 verses 7 and 8 the Bible says the law is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple the statutes of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. I tell you what, the Bible will straighten out a crooked man. That's what the Bible will do. It'll straight, it'll make those paths that are crooked straight. That's what the Bible does. The Bible will do its work. I, I'm going to tell you what the churches have done. The church in America have gotten away from preaching the Bible. They've stopped preaching on sin. They won't name sin. They'll call it wrongdoing. Or they'll call it, well, mistakes. I'm sorry, uh, your mistakes are not the problem. Uh, God didn't die for your mistakes. i tell you what a mistake is. When you go to the restaurant and uh, you order something, and then you look at the person beside you order something, like I did on Thursday night, and I said, oh, man, I wish I'd ordered that. Right? I mean, I didn't know I could get chicken and shrimp. I only thought I could get shrimp, uh, chicken on the rice. I didn't know I could get shrimp. But you know what? I won't make that mistake twice. That mistake, let me tell you something. That mistake my Savior didn't die for. He didn't die whether I get chicken or shrimp on my rice. He died for my sin. Your sin. That's what the Bible does, folks. It tells us where we've been wrong and uh, how to get right. Would you look at Psalm 119 now? Psalm 119, verse, Psalm 119, verse 130, if you would. Psalm 119 and 130 there. Psalm, Psalm 119, 130. I'll wait for you to get there. All right, Psalm 119, 130. The Bible says the entrance, would you look at that? It says the entrance of thy words giveth light, and it giveth understanding unto the simple. <laughs> I'm so thankful. Do you, did, I mean, Miss Boot said, I'm glad. Did you know that this book, and don't get offended by this because I want to clarify, this book is written on about a sixth grade level. Now, I'm not saying this book, I'm dumbing down this book. This book is very complex. This, this book is, is, is God in here. This, this is His Word. This is His living Word. Uh, but understand, this book is written on about a sixth grade level. In other words, what I'm saying is, we can understand this. God wants you to understand His Word. God wants you to know His Word. And let me say this very clearly tonight. We've been going through the series, and I, I, I want you to know that we here at Freedom do not hold to any Calvinistic beliefs here. We do not hold true to any Calvinistic teaching or theology that comes from uh, a, a man named John Calvin who got it from St. Augustine. And uh, to some of you, this absolutely means nothing. I say St. Augustine, I say John Calvin. Uh, you don't know who in the world that is. And for you, I say awesome. 
But there are a lot of people who do know what this is. And there are a lot of people that get confused in this and they intertwine this stuff within their belief system. And before you know it, they get all mixed up and they don't know what they believe. And the Calvinistic uh, teaching uses an acrostic that I've told you before. They use the word tulip. Everybody say tulip. I'm not talking about a bulb or, or a tulip flower. Okay, so if you type in, and by the way, you, you can find this all over the internet. You, you can go right to uh, uh, the Calvinistic or Calvin website and pull up their information. Matter of fact, that's what I did. Because I did, I did not want to misquote what they teach. But they use an acrostic called a uh, word called TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And it stands for this. The T stands for total depravity. We've gone through this, but they teach that mankind is totally unable to seek God. Man is too depraved to even reach out to God and find Him. Guess what? <laughs> Not in the Bible. Wrong, wrong, wrong. They use the word U for, in TULIP. It stands for unconditional election. Some people are born into this world and that from the foundation of the world, God sovereignly chose them and others are damned by God. They believe that there is nothing that man can do. God has chosen them to be saved and, and that God only died for the elect. Even before Adam and Eve were created, God chose these people to be his own. Can I tell you? <laughs> Wrong. That's not in the Bible, folks. Okay? And if you're sitting there going, well, I'm not real sure. Well, we have spent weeks on this. You need to be sure. That's not in the Bible. The word L or letter L stands for limited atonement. That there is limited people that God sent his son to die for. In other words, the atonement of God is not meant to be for everyone. Imagine that. How'd you like how would you like to knock on that door and hand that gospel track out? I'm not real sure if this is for you. How embarrassing. How, hey, how blasphemous that is. That's terrible. Only that God has, uh, uh, only those that have been elected have his atonement. I, I don't even, that don't even make sense to me. Therefore, that is why it's limited. Now, I'm pulling this off their website. I'm not making it up. They say something to the effect that God's grace, now listen to this, you don't have to really be a thinker. Everybody tell your neighbor, say, be a thinker. All right. They say something to the effect of this, and, and this is word for word. God's grace is sufficient to save all, but only efficient to save those who are elected. God's grace is sufficient to save all. Don't even write that down. I see somebody, don't even write that statement down. I'm afraid you'll believe, don't even write that down. You're going to make me panic when you write that statement down. Don't write that down. Yeah, don't write that down because you may go back to that years from now and go, well, that's a really good statement. No, it's a heresy statement. They say that God's grace is sufficient to save all, but only efficient to save those who are elected. That doesn't even make sense, folks. They don't even teach grace. How can you say grace and yet at the same time teach election? How can you say limit atonement yet use in the same sentence grace? It's not the same. They use the letter I in TULIP and it stands for irresistible grace. This is the thought that man cannot resist God's grace once he decides to sovereignly elect someone. Now, I, wa I wasn't saved till I was 27. Who was saved? Anybody saved here after, uh, uh, older than that, Tim, Brother Tim? How old were you? 55? Was anybody older than 55? You weren't saved till you were 55? Well, brother, it's about time God elected you. He finally got around to it. I'm going to tell you something what you did, Brother Tim. And if I put words in your mouth, you stand up right now and say differently. You absolutely rejected God for those 55 years. Am I right or wrong? You didn't choose God, is that right? 
He resisted God's grace. Was God's grace still available during those 55, time, 55 years? Kathy, uh, did you know him before he was saved? Did you know him before he was saved? So you know that he rejected, rejected that. He didn't want that, right? Uh, case in point, 55 years. Wasn't saved till he's 55. That's, a, that's incredible. For 55 years, Tim made a choice. I want nothing to do with God. But thank God Tim made that choice. Amen? God's grace is sufficient to save me, to save a sinner like me. And whatever that moment was, Brother Tim, at that point, said, I'll take that grace. I'll take that forgiveness. I'll take Him as my Savior. I'll choose His grace. I'll choose His forgiveness. And what I'm saying tonight is that, uh, that uh, they, the, in their irresistible grace, they, they say once God decides upon whom He is going to elect or choose, they have no choice in the matter and can't resist it. Folks, that's a lot of Tom Fuller right there. That stuff doesn't make sense. The letter P in TULIP stands for perseverance of the saints. And, 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 and I put this in my notes because I'm not even sure I can adequately explain this point. I've studied it and read it and, and I'm, I'm absolutely confused by it, I have to be honest with you. Because basically they say you can't lose your salvation, which we would agree, amen? Eternal security, right? Because that's what the Bible teaches. But then they bring in the kingdom principle and the covenant agreement that reflects what God told the nation of Israel, that whatever you do, it will be impossible for you to fall from grace, and that you'll always return back to God, and He will empower you to do so until the end. Now, I believe, because the Bible teaches this in eternal security, that you cannot lose your salvation. However, I do believe that a Christian can fall from grace. In other words... A Christian can backslide. A Christian can sin. A Christian can be wicked. They don't believe that. They believe once you are, once you are elected or chosen or, 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 or predestined unto God, that whomever he elects and, and pours out his grace, once you because you couldn't resist it, that once that happens, well, it's a done deal. And that you'll always return back. Listen, I know Christians right now who won't come to the church. But I do believe they're saved. Now, just because you don't attend a church doesn't mean you're not saved. However, it's a poor testimony of a Christian. I'll tell you that. It's a poor testimony. And we believe in eternal security because that's what the Bible teaches. And, 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 and they say that, that, that they'll return back to God because He'll empower them somehow just to hang on till the end. I'm going to tell you, this is religious jargon that they're doing. And, and, and it doesn't make sense. And, and uh, Calvinists treat this as sinless perfection. And I'm going to tell you something, that is not a biblical term. I don't know one Christian that has ever been saved. I mean trusted Christ as their Savior and never committed another sin. I don't know one Christian that's ever done that. I've never done it. You've never done it. That's why there needs to be a constant feeling of Christ's Spirit in us. Yes, I have Christ's Spirit, but I'm going to tell you, that doesn't mean you're always filled with His Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk as in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. What you are filled with, you are controlled by. Did you get that? What you're filled with controls you. I'm going to tell you, I've seen some Christians do some stupid stuff. Amen? I've done some stupid stuff. I've done some stuff that's not, that's not right. I've done some stuff that's not, that's not uh, godly. I've done some stuff that's not uh, righteous. I've done stuff that doesn't please my Father. However, I know that I am saved. But let me just say this, that I'm not hung up, if you may think so, I'm not hung up on Calvinism. I'm not hung up on what they teach. I'm more concerned about that you are given God's word rightly divided and that you know what you believe. That's what I care about. I care about feeding the flock. 
And I care about giving you God's Word in its entirety and giving you the whole counsel of God's Word. I, I care about you understanding the Bible. And, and by the way, no one has ever come up, not even John Cal. nobody has ever come up with this Calvinistic theology or come up with that belief system by just, now listen, reading the Bible. You had to be taught that stuff. Now let that sink in for a moment. If you have read your Bible, and I would believe that many of you have and you know your Bible, when you read that Bible, you know what I come away with? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. When I read this Bible, I'll come away with knowing that God has His arms outstretched and that He is long-suffering to the lost and that He loves the lost and He cares for the hurting and that He draws nigh to them that are of a broken spirit. I come away with, from this Bible knowing that God loves people and that He's not willing that any should perish but that all would come to everlasting life. I come away from reading my Bible knowing that God sent His Son. Uh, the Bible says that, that He who knew no sin became sin. When I read my Bible, I come away knowing that God loves the world and He doesn't want any to perish. He came to redeem the world. He came to forgive the world. And He came to save the world. That's what I get from this book. And so when people come up with that ideology and that theology... They didn't get it from this book. They get it from what some man taught them. My life doesn't res revolve around that stuff, folks. However, I do believe it's right to preach the whole counsel of God's Word and to reprove teaching that is diametrically opposite of God's Word. I don't have any animosity to the, the Calvinist. Uh, I, a matter of fact, I have some friends that, are, that hold true to some Calvinistic theology. Uh, they're not five-point Calvinist, uh, the tulip part, but they agree with a couple parts. And, and, uh, uh, and some are in the ministry. And uh, some are, are, are they're great preachers. And, 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 and I, don't, I, don't, I have a good relationship with them. But, but I just want you to have a greater understanding of your Bible and, 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 and to grow biblically when it comes to this kind of stuff. And, 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 and some of them have even changed their stance on this teaching uh, numerous times over the years. And, uh, you know, even, even Calvinists, even Calvinism has changed their stance. You know, it used to be Calvinism, and then it became uh, the Great Reformation, okay? Uh, John Calvin did that. They changed it to the Great Reformation, but then they changed it to the Doctrines of Grace, and that's very confusing. And I have to be honest with you, their teaching doesn't lend to any doctrines of grace at all. Doesn't make sense. And the truth tonight is, is that God's Word gives mankind the capacity to seek Him. And we got to stay focused and centered on God's teaching and not some man's religion or system or ideology or philosophy or theology. Folks, we got to stay right on God's Word. So, I want you to go to John 6 now. Hope you've been holding it. All right? Nine minutes. Put the time watch on it, all right? Nine minutes. I'm, I'm going to be good. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey my Word to you. John chapter 6. Now, I want you to look at verse 44. John chapter 6. I want you to look at verse 44. Would you do that? The Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 44, No man can come to me, no man can come to me, except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Brother Mike, you could say, but, whoa, preacher, you just said that everyone can seek God. But doesn't John 6 say that the Father must draw on you before you can come to Christ? 
And Calvinism will use that passage that teaches unconditional election. They'll use, before the foundation of the world, God chose some people to be saved, and only those that are chosen can come to Jesus. That's how they'll put it. But what does this passage really teach here? Because they'll pull this passage right out of the Bible. They'll pull it right out and go, well, look, see, see, God has to draw them. You can't come. But I want you to look at verse 44 again. Would you look at it? I want you to look at it. I want you to read it. I want you to look at verse 44. What number is this verse? Not a trick question. What number is this? That would mean, and everybody look up here, because you, 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 you can figure this out. If there are 44 verses, how many are before 43? I just told you. Stink. If there are 44 verses up to this point, how many verses are before this? You are, guys are on it. Man, it's almost like you knew the answer. There are 43 verses before it. Now, how many verses are total in chapter 6? Could you, could you see it? How many? 71. So 71 and 44. So how, how many are after 44? 27! Are there any CPAs in here? Donnie, you should have got that, man. You should have, boop. 27. Now, if I, if I take verse 44, and there's 43 before it and 27 after it, we could actually say that this is in the middle of the, would you say? Chapter, well, it starts with a C. It's really in the middle of the context. Okay? chapter I'll take that but it's really in the middle of the context now can we read verse 44 I want you to look at it now and let me help you with something no man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day now the question is what about John 6 and verse 44 and the father's drawing we could easily take 44 and lift it from the context and go see I told you that what I taught you was correct. I can develop a theology or a doctrine and say, Miss Boots, God can only save and will only save those who He elects. And you will say, well, how? And I will say, John 6, 44. And you will look at John 6, 44, and you will go, Wow, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him. Wow, Pastor Larry, you are so smart. The only problem with that is, I have taken a scripture out of its context, and I haven't given you anything before or anything after. Now, I'm all for doing that and quoting scriptures and doing that if we know the context. If I quote John 3.16 to you, I think you have the context. And I, I, I can't really, I, I, I'm not making up a new doctrine or theology or ideology from that verse. You've got that. But what other teachers do is that they pull these scriptures out and what they do is they don't give you some previous verses to it or, pre or verses after it to help explain it. Now look at verse 45. This is enlightening. Ready? 45. It is written in the prophets. And they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath what? 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 And hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Hello, somebody ring the doorbell, turn the light, switch on. The Father draws those to him that hear his word and then respond to his word. That's what verse 45 says. The Bible says, as 
It is written. Not chosen. Not just mysteriously moved upon. Even the people in this writing here, the Jews, the nation of Israel, they knew that the scriptures had been written. And they knew that when the gospel writer John wrote this, they knew when he said, it is written, he was saying, you should know this stuff already. Why? Because God wrote it. What have we been learning over the last few weeks? God uses the word to bring people to salvation, folks. This verse is enlightening. God gave his word and told Israel his will. The prophets taught them that their Messiah would come. Now look at verse 45. And I want you to answer this question. Look at it. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now I'm going to ask you a question. It's not a trick question, but I want, to answer it. I want you to answer it. Ready? Here it is. How many in Israel were taught? Use the Bible word. What's it say? Now, look at here, folks. You may not have a sixth grade education. You may not have a finished high school. You may not have a college degree. You may not have a Bible degree. But you can understand the word A-L-L. Right? And if I take the word A-L-L, what does it mean? Can you give me another word for all? Thank you. And if I take that passage and I go to John 6, 44, and I say, Woo, except the Father draw them, no man can come unto the Father. Then I would absolutely be changing Scripture and be disregarding the word all. I said this to begin with. You can take Scripture and make it say anything you want to say. But that is not being true to the text. I'm going to tell you, God will hold every person accountable for what they add and for what they take away from this book. We better be careful, folks. Listen, you, you can sing a song that somebody may like. You may put down carpet that somebody may not like. You may paint a building that somebody may not like in a church. But you better not change God's word. You will stand before our God, our holy and mighty God, and you will give an account for what you did with his word. Hey, that's serious business in my book. God will not hold him guiltless. Very serious. If anybody in Israel wanted to know what God said, they could look in his word. Now, notice it said how many are taught? Verse 45, how many? How many? But notice, how did they get it? It is written in the prophets... And they shall all be taught of God. And then it says, Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. How, how many people heard it? All of them. And then how were they taught? They were taught by the Word. Folks, in closing, let me say this. If a person wants to be saved today, you know what they need? They need the Word of God. That's all they need. They need somebody who will just give them the word. Point out that they're a sinner. Point out that there's a Savior. And point out that they must surrender to that Savior for their sins to be forgiven. That's, that's what it takes. They must surrender their life. In other words, they must turn to Christ in faith. That means turn from their ideology. As Paul said, they turn from the idols to the true and living God, I turn from my thoughts, what I choose to do, the way I want to live, and I recognize that this is the right way to live. Doesn't mean I'll do it perfectly, but what it does mean is that I believe that what Jesus did is enough to forgive me and save me of my sins. How does the Father draw people to, to Christ? Well, according to John 6, if we put it in its proper context, God teaches people and draws people through His Word as it is 
written. Folks, we can't just take Scripture out of, out of context and go, see here, and raise that up the flagpole and go, oh, here it is. See, I told you, told you, told you, told you, told you, told you. Well, hold on. Let's get the context here. Let's make sure we understand it. And, and what will help us and make sure that we're always on the right track, let's always figure out, well, who's writing? When was it written? And who are they writing to? Who's doing the writing? When was it written? And who are they writing to? And by the way, who they are writing to will always help you put Scripture in its right context. All right? I hope that was helpful tonight. We're going to dive into this next Sunday and really get going. But I just wanted to kind of introduce this to you tonight. Hope this was helpful. By the way, we got a lot more to discover in the weeks ahead. And we're going to take those difficult passages. And I'm going to pull them out that, that others use. But we're going to rightly divide it and make sure that we hold it in truth in light of God's Word. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight.